At the end of the 16th century, a group of London merchants banded together to import spices from South Asia. Each contributed money to purchase goods and ships. The British East India Company was founded by a charter granted by Queen Elizabeth I in the year 1600. The new company was one of the world's first joint stock corporations. The company established trade centers in the cities along the Indian coastline. During the 1600s, main imports were pepper, cloves, and nutmeg from Sumatra and the Spice Islands. English silver was traded for cotton, silk, and precious stones. Expansion into China introduced tea to the British, a lucrative source of revenue for the company. The company eventually elbowed out other European traders and established a monopoly. Financial and political deals with the English government enabled them to become the only importer of Indian-made goods to Europe and the only legal supplier of Chinese tea in England. They held a monopoly on Chinese tea for 135 years. At its peak, the company established trade routes through Asia and the Middle East, China, and controlled half of the world's trade. The company effectively served as an instrument of imperialism for England. The British government and the company had a symbiotic relationship. In exchange for trading rights and lifting of import tariffs, the company expanded the reach of the British Empire in the East. As the company grew in power, so too did England. The company established factories throughout India, trading colonies under the supervision of a factor. The factor and his agents purchased goods from local merchants and stored or transported them to port to await the arrival of company ships. As the company grew, they found it necessary to hire their own military to protect their interests. To win trading concessions from Indian rulers, the company agreed to use its military assets to defend natives against more powerful invaders. There were three armies of India. Each maintained its own army, with a commander-in-chief. These armies were funded entirely out of East India Company's Indian revenues and together were larger than the British Army itself. When it suited their needs, the company used their military assets to extend their power through brutal confrontations and battles with local forces. Robert Clive defeated the Mughal Empire Emperor and put a puppet ruler on the throne. He also seized the treasury and granted himself the right to collect tax revenue, making him one of the richest men in England. The company effectively became the ruler of territories vastly larger than the United Kingdom itself, an area of 20 million inhabitants. Martial rule allowed the company to make money easily. With such enormous growth, the need arose to print their own currency, both coinage and paper money. After the conquest of the Mughal Empire in 1757, the president of the East India Company in London effectively became the Emperor of India. The attitude of British officials is reflected in this statement from Robert Clive in 1765. We have at last arrived at that critical period which I have long foreseen. I mean the period which renders it necessary for us to determine whether we can or shall take the whole of India to ourselves. Alarmed at reports of gross atrocities at the hands of East India Company soldiers, Parliament passed the Regulating Act of 1773 to rein in the power of the company. An English Governor-General named Warren Hastings was placed to rule over India. As in Bengal, the company created compliant puppet rulers they could control. The company recruited natives, known as sepoys, into military service. They were primarily high-caste Hindus from the northern provinces of India. The Sepoy Rebellion of 1857 was the turning point where Great Britain officially occupied India. A mutiny was sparked by new ammunition cartridges that were rumored to be greased with pig or cow fat, offensive to both Muslims and Hindus. Two years of fighting led to distrust and bad feelings between the British and the Indians. In India, one is always sitting on a volcano. As a result of massive military expenditures in the year 1757 to 1770, the company was failing. Known as Raj Rule, the British Crown officially took over governance of India in 1858. After rising to heights of greatness never achieved before or since by a business interest, the British East India Company went out of existence in 1873. For 250 years, one of the largest empires in the world was controlled by a corporation. The impact they left on the people of India and the British Empire lives on in our language, 
our view, culture, and our view of the world. Many of their deeds were unfair and brutal, but we are richer by studying their legacy.